come in worshiping our Father. Um, right now, I just want to pray. I want to thank you, Father, for all the good things. I pray over this morning that you would just prepare our hearts and minds, Jesus, as we come before you. As we lay everything at your feet, Jesus. You are so good. You are so merciful. You deserve all the praise and all the glory, Father. We exalt you. We exalt you above every other name. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we thank you, Father. I exalt thee.
Let's just sit in his presence for a couple minutes. Just 
tell him, exalt him, exalt him. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. Right now, where you are, exalt him. Let your incense rise. Let your incense rise. sing this one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You are. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you court in the throne room and God just kept showing it to me over and over and again the outer court inner court throne room and I kept hearing him say that and the question was where do we want to be do we want to be standing on the outer court this doesn't just go for you it goes for me but I felt like it was to share with everyone whatever we're facing whatever we're going through whether it's a physical battle whether it's a mental battle, whether it's finding direction, whether it's finding where he wants us to, to, to be, whether it's finding our calling or gifting, whatever it is, whether we're going through some trial, whether we're going through some difficulties, God is saying, where do we want to be? We want to stand on the outer court watching and just standing, waiting, just spectating. Do we want to step into the next level or do we want to get into the throne room of God and find answers and direction? Get into his throne room. Get at his feet. Call on the name of the Lord. He's saying, call on me. Come to me. He's saying, I don't want you to stand out there. I don't want you to stand on in the, in the between place. He's saying, I want you to come right where I'm at. Right, right to me. He's saying, call on me. Bow before me. Come into the room with me. Into your innermost sanction. Into the innermost presence with God. Because that's where we're going to find answers. That's where we're going to find what he's wanting us to do. Calling on us. What he's wanting to lead us through or help us through and I don't believe that's just for me he just kept telling me come up here and share it for whoever it is whoever it is he's saying don't just stay out on the outer court he's saying come into the in, into the throne room with with him today with him this morning
I see your face in every sunrise. The colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say,
something on my heart for today and uh, it's going to be a little different than normal and uh, it goes right along with what the Holy Spirit's doing here today and I know in my heart that he's saying he's not done with what he started today so um, so communion the first thing I think of um, it takes me back to when I was a child and my dad and this is 30 some years ago to my first knowledge of what he told me he wouldn't let us take communion as a child without turning around and he'd huddle us three boys and he would explain to us the significance of communion and I wasn't, like I said, it, it's probably longer, 30 years ago, probably closer to 40 years ago, but uh, I didn't get the significance of it at that time. I was just a child. I didn't have the understanding and uh, over the last couple months here when the Lord's placed this on my heart, uh, I've come to this realization of what my dad was trying to teach us as a child and, and that was you need to go into communion with a pure heart you need, to, you need to really examine yourself every aspect of your heart before you take communion because the Bible tells us and I'll read some scripture in a minute um, of what happens if you don't take communion correctly and so a lot of times communion becomes a tradition or it's religious or it's religion. It's not a heart thing. It's just we pass the plates, we take it. We don't think anything more about it. But the Bible tells us it's way more than that. And so um, I'm not going to read the actual communion scriptures because we all know the bread is his body. You know, it was broken for us. And same thing with the drink. It was his blood poured out to cover our sins. And so, if I can find my app, there it is. So, in 1 Corinthians 11, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with 27. Uh, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and, and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned of the world. Obviously, John 3, 16 through 17 says the Lord came not to condemn the world, but to save it. And so, what we're going to do today for communion, I just want us to sit from now 
through pastor's message and examine our hearts. Examine our hearts. And there will be a time of altar time after pastor's done preaching and given the word. And during that time, I feel the Holy Spirit saying that there's going to be some healings take place. There's going to be some breakthrough. And um, I guess to, to cap all this off, what the Holy Spirit was telling me back there is the, the, if I was going to put a title on what I just spoke was what's holding you back. And uh, a couple months ago, the men's team met with the youth and the Lord gave me a vision. And it was of a, a miner going through a heart like your heart. And it was looking in the darkest corners and he was pickaxing off the things that weren't in your sight that had to be illuminated. And, and this miner was looking around and he was chipping off things that were holding you back from what the Lord wants. And so I, in this time between now and altar, examine your heart. See what, what your desires are. If you're, if you're desiring healing, if you're desiring what, what is holding you back, what, what is in the hitting places that you have not given over to the Lord yet. And so that's basically what I had for today. And um, like I said, Pastor, when we're done with altar, we will then take communion together. So thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is great. Amen. Yeah. How good he is. And we come to him with thanksgiving and praise today, right? worship the Lord in giving as our ushers come. Jesus speaks to us to give. We want to honor the Lord always with everything that he has given us to give. Uh, each one of us is a, uh, a treasure chest in ways to give. You can be kind. You can help others. You can give encouragement and your talents. Much, you have much to give. Never think you don't have anything to give because God has blessed us so much in that area. But as we bring our tithe and offering and alms this morning, he says in Luke 6 and 38, he says, give, and then it will be given to you. I have a little story I want to try to share with us, but I think it will speak to you as it did me. It said there was once an, an old barefoot pe peasant walking down the side of the dirt road. He was haggard, destitute, weathered, and unkept. He was carrying a small wooden bowl of rice. Holding the bowl of rice close to his face, he was carefully scraping each kernel to his, of the rice into his mouth with his bare hands. Suddenly, the sound of a hundred horses filled the air. The peasant glanced up from the bowl to, ob to observe the commotion. A thick dust cloud stretched to the heavens shading the sun's rays from the wretched man's eyes. Yet he perceived through the dust a large, shiny gold chariot en encompassed by an entourage of beautiful horses ridden by knights in glistening armor. As the chariot approached, the ground trembled and, and pounding of the horse's hooves, and the cloud of dust covered the peasant's weary head. He pulled his tattered shawl over his weathered face to shield his eyes from the, from the onslaught and maybe to hide his face in shame. He cursed the king's entourage under his breath, grumbling about the gall of the rich man's inconsiderate arrogance. The mere pace of the king's entourage and the breath of his train struck, stuck in the crawl of the poor peasant's heart. Abruptly, the chariot came to a halt beside the peasant. The old man peered carefully through the shawl, waiting for the dust to pass over him. The wealthy king, his crown gleaming with jewels, slowly opened the door of his chariot. The peasant hid his face in shame as the rich, rich king graciously spoke. May I have some of your rice, please? The king requested, to a bewilderment of everyone. The peasant lifted his shawl over his face as he is retreating into a private inner office to contemplate his situation. As he mumbled something under his breath, his shaky hand emerged reluctantly from the breath, from the beneath his shawl, carefully measuring out three kernels of rice into the king's hand. The king, filled with gratitude, kindly thanked the old peasant. 
Then he opened up his treasure chest and slowly counted out three gold coins, placing each of them carefully in the peasant's outstretched hand. As the, king, as the king's entourage began moving again and made its way past the peasant, he ripped off the ragged outer garments, tossing them to the ground. He yelled, Oh, that I would have given him the whole bowl. Think about that. In your giving, in your sharing of your talents, of your monies, of your finances. We know it takes finances to run things. And Jesus is not just talking about the money. He's talking about giving. Have a heart of giving. And he says, it will come back to you, shaken together, running over. And I'm, I'm sure many of us can sit here and testify to that, of times in our lives when that's happened because of your obedience your obedience to give and maybe you decided hey what I what I first got out that's that's not enough that's kind of stingy hey I, I can attest by I've, I've been there well it's kind of shortchanging and I believe a little bit so put just a little more with that give just a little bit more and see what happens trust the Lord he is good he he always blesses abundantly and I know he teaches a lot about farming. I know, I know you plant corn, you get corn. You don't get, you don't get beans. You plant corn, you get corn. So I believe when you give of your finances, the Lord will cause that to grow. He will, he will cause that to run over for you. But it's out of that heart. It's out of the way we decide to give. He says, let each man decide in his heart. How do you decide to give? Generously? Generously will get you out of debt. It will get you out of poverty if you give generously. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace, your goodness. We thank you, God, for your presence that as we gather this morning, God, you have just, you're just here in a mighty way. I believe already you are touching our hearts. You're helping us to see more clearly. And uh, God, as we worship you this morning in giving, we so thankfully come to you. We bring the tithes and the offerings today, God. And, and we want to give what is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Want to always bless him, don't you? Yeah. Praise him, give him glory and honor yeah. in everything that we do. Amen. Let's not forget out on the table there is a sign-up sheet that is for us to sign up for the gifts class that's coming up next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Please don't forget that. I know you're going to want to be a part of that if you have not taken that class. You need to be in it. A lot of our youth are signed up for that, but there may be some of you adults that need to sign up for that. How many of you want to know what your gifts are? Huh? How many of you want to know what your gifts are? So you can fulfill what it is God wants you to do. Amen? So sign up. Today at 5 o'clock we will be having prayers. So everyone come out and be a part of that. I know that God's got some great things for us in store as we pray and seek Him and call out and declare the word of the Lord. How many of you believe we need to be declaring the word of the Lord right now? Not just reading it, not just seeing it, but declare it. Confess it, speak it. I believe, therefore I speak. Amen? All right, let's all stand. This is what we do here. We stand now, and we go around, we high-five, we fist bump, we hug, we do a little greet and meet.
meet and greet, greet and meet, meet and greet. Go talk to somebody you don't know and introduce yourself.
So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. and shake before you the demons are running the Lord showed me that you have wells that have been clogged, dumped in, the heap and the trash of life, the busyness of life, the things that so many times we don't even realize is clogging up the well, and then we move past that well and we go on. And we, we don't think that much about it. We, we just keep pressing on. And what happens is, though, the enemy sees that he's clogged that well, and he says, okay, well, you know what? She didn't do anything about that. I'm going to clog this well. And I believe I saw the Holy Spirit begin to move, and he, it, it, was, it was though he sent his angels with spiritual shovels and began to dig out the wells that have been covered over in your life that God is, was working and doing in your life that you feel like, God, where has that gone? 
And the Lord wants you to know that right now, today, in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, all the things the enemy's trying to do, physically, mentally, and every other way, with life in general, God says, today is the day that I am unclogging the wells that the enemy has tried to cover over and bury. And I can see the Lord right now sending his angels to dig down deep. And guess what I saw when the final scoop of dirt came out? A river came gushing out. A river of water came gushing out. And today is your day of release. It doesn't matter what else the enemy says. God is doing it right now. And God says, believe me. Because I also sent them over here. They're digging a fresh new well. It's a fresh day for you. A change but a fresh day. Trust me, says the Lord. Don't be afraid, for I'm with you. You are my daughter, and I've called you by your name. You're mine. And all of this will not overtake you. so good to see you. The Lord wants me to tell you He sees your heart, your passion, your desire, your hunger. He sees what in your private times that nobody else sees. He sees what you're going after. He sees that you're doing everything you can to dig deep to not allow yourself to be on the surface or just not allow yourself to be on the fringes. You are a person that you desire everything that God has for you and everything that God wants out of you. You desire to fulfill it while you still have an opportunity to do so. And God says the reason why you're desiring to go deep right now is because I'm moving on you, says the Lord. It's not out of your own passion or your own desire. It's something that I'm doing in you. And I want you to know this is a new day, says the Lord, in which I am going to help you to drink out of a river that is going to cause you so much revelation, cause you to have so much that you never dreamed possible to have. I'm going to do it, says the Lord, and the things that you have been seeking after, the things that you have been declaring unto me, says the Lord, the things that you don't feel like I've answered, says God, I am speaking to you right now that they are going to come to a pass, and I will bring you to the place that you need to go, where your thirst is going to be quenched because I'm going to give you the water that you seek after. I'm going to take you deep deeper than you thought or imagined you don't even know what yet lies ahead for you if you trust me says the Lord sing it through sing it through the mountains shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell for any who can stand before the power in the presence of the great I am, the great I am, the great.
Come on, church, worship the Lord. You are great. You are mighty, God. You are holy, Lord. You are God Almighty. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Our God is worthy. Our God is worthy. Our God is worthy of praise. He's worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be celebrated. Our God's worthy. Lord, we magnify you. We lift you up. We give you all the praise. And everybody shout it. Amen. Praise the Lord. I looked at my surface here. And my surface doesn't have a clock on it. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Then I looked over and I... I saw my phone, and my phone has a nasty clock on it, and the nasty clock says 11.50, <laughs> and I have on my Surface Pro that doesn't have a clock. 11 pages of notes. Of something that I believe God has been working on me for a long time. Convicting me. Drawing me into a deeper place on my knees, navigating myself with his presence. I feel the unction of the Lord, the burning passion. And I know that Things that I'm going to say today, I have said before in different ways, and it's not like it's going to be anything specifically new, so to speak, to you probably. But I believe God wants me to address something that we're living in that I believe is important for us to hear. I want to talk to us today about Christianity versus the kingdom of God. That in itself sounds a little off. Aren't they one and the same? Christianity and the kingdom of God. And I want you to know that I believe they should be. I believe they should be. One and the same, but I don't believe in the day that we're living in that they are one and the same. Christianity today stands in judgment under the authority of heaven. I believe God has called me as an apostolic father with a prophetic gift to speak to the church today. I wish that I could speak to the church worldwide today. But I'm here to speak to us, Bethesda. And I believe that he has given me as a father here at this church the authority to speak to us what I'm going to say. I have been a part of this thing called Christianity since 1978. I have had good times and I have had rough times. I have had times in which I feel that, man, I was really, really getting closer and closer and closer to the Lord. And I have had times when I have felt that, man, I was so, so 
far away. But yet God never abandoned me. Jesus can be in you, but you not be in him. That's why we can still be carnal. Come on. Jesus has never left me. He has never forsaken me. He has been true to his word. But I'm going to tell you what, there are times in my life when I am not in him. But yet something, no matter what was going on in my life, something still drove me that I wanted the truth. I wanted the truth. I wanted truth. I wanted to know what thus saith the word of the Lord. I wanted to make sure that I was not sitting there intentionally preaching half-truths. I wanted everyone to know that I believed in the book and I was going to preach the book, even if the book was thrashing me at the time. Because I want you to know the Word of God is cutting my heart deep. I speak to us today in the name of Jesus. Under which there is no other name whereby man can be saved. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is the one in who we look to. It's Jesus that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. Everything we do is in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We cast out demons in the name of Jesus. We heal the sick in the name of Jesus. Come on. Because in Him, in His deity is everything that you and I are about. Without Him, we're nothing. So I speak today concerning Christianity, and I bring charges against Christianity today. I I stand here today with charges against Christianity because we are failing, we are failing the church's children. People throughout the world are confused, and because of their confusion, they embrace false doctrines and false religions. Because of the confusion that's in the church today, because of the confusion that is in Christianity today, the Bible teaches us that they go after, itching, with itching ears, doctrines of devils. Because of the fact that we, in some ways, in some forms, are denying the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. We charge Christianity today with the crimes against God that they are doing in in their lives of every day, accusing, accusing them of turning away from Jesus Christ, the truth and the way and the life. Because how we portray Jesus, we make him out to be a liar. Some of our doctrines, some of the things that we hold to, the traditions of men, only make us look foolish in the eyes of the people of the world. I come against Christianity today for not believing the whole word of God. I said I come against Christianity today because they don't believe the whole word of God. We have people that are educated, people that are doctors, and people that are highly educated in theology. They consider themselves theologians, who do not believe big chunks of the Bible because they feel like it's been handed down from generation to generation by man. And we do know this, don't we, that man does err. But I want to tell you what, the same Holy Spirit that moved on men, breathed on men to write this Bible, the same God that breathed on them to do and give us what we have today is the same God that has preserved it all down through generations. Flower fades, the grass withers, but God's word will never fail. Not one dot of the I, not one cross of the T shall depart from the word of the Lord. But yet, many pulpits today don't preach all of the Bible. Amen. 
But yet John wrote in Revelations, in Revelations 22, 19, he says this. If any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. How many of you know the Bible is, the whole book is prophecy? It is a declaration, it is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. The son of the living God from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. It is a revealing of the God that would come in the flesh. That's why they knew, should have known when Jesus was coming because they had been hearing it for generations. I'm going to tell you what, it doesn't stop there. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 12, he says this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. The scripture writes and says the gospel of Christ is the power of salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's what what brought me by the power of the word of God brought me to salvation. As we have said before, and so now I again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of God, of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached by me is not according to man. For I did not receive it. I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. I stand here today and tell you that the Christianity that we have today throughout this world and throughout this land is a Christianity that they are altering the word of the Lord. And they are teaching a religion that only offers a fig leaf to cover up because they find themselves weighed in the balance and wanting. Because we try to cover up and hide what we find ourselves walking in. Instead of confessing to the Lord Jesus Christ that we, Lord, know that we fall short. But thank you, God, for your grace. But yet when we say that God's grace is sufficient because the Bible said where sin is, grace abounds. We believe that, don't we? But the church today has taken that to a place that God does not intend for us to take it. Because what the church has done, we have given people a license to go out here and live a life of sin in which then they come back and say, but yet even though I'm doing that, God's grace is sufficient. But I want to tell you something. Listen to me. When we go out here and live a life of sin, there's two things that might be manifesting. One of the things that might be manifesting is that you've never been born again. Did you hear me? You say, oh, I'm in a real battle with sin. I just can't get away from sin. I seem to always be in sin. I walk in it, live in it every day, every week. How many of you know that's not what God wants? How many of you know then God doesn't want us to come along and say, well, pastor, everybody fails. Everybody falls short. Everybody comes short of the glory of God. How many of you you can raise your hand and say that yes and amen to that? We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? 
But what, but what happens is, and what has happened, is that the church has taken that to another degree in which we accept the fact that we are falling short. We accept the fact that we are living in sin. We have, uh, accept the fact that we are corrupted. Instead of falling on our face and weeping before the Lord and repenting and crying out, we brush ourselves off as though it really don't matter. But we need to realize, man, sin separates us from the presence of God. Sin weakens us. Sin affects us. Sin cuts us. Sin enslaves us. Come on. But yet, we find ourselves hiding a cover-up and a belief that no matter how we're living, it's all right. Grace does cover a multitude of sins. But I'll tell you what else grace has a power to do. Grace has a power to keep me. From sin. Grace has the power, if I will trust God, get, grace has the power to keep me in His rightness. Huh? Grace has the power to keep me in His holiness. Be ye holy, even as He is holy. Come out from among them, says the Lord, and be separate. Hello? <laughs> You say, man, Pastor, I didn't know you believed this. I can't believe you would say that. I believe it's for me. I believe it's for you. I believe it's for our children. I believe it's for our children's children. God's calling us not to get further away from him. God's calling us to get closer. God's not calling us to be in bondage. God's calling us to be free. God doesn't want us to be in the prison. He's opened the prison door. God's called us to break out of prison. He's called us to break out of bondage. He does not want me to be in bondage to what I was in bondage to 10 years ago. If we're still in bondage to the things that we were in bondage to two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, we're not growing. The second thing that might be happening to us is, one, we're not born again. Two, we may be a prodigal. Those are your only two choices. If you're walking in a life of sin, if you're living a lifestyle of sin, I'm not talking about you went out here and somebody cut you off in traffic and you did something that was sin. Huh? How many of you know becoming angry and doing things that you shouldn't do is sin? How many, how many of you know, speeding up and chasing that person down so you can give them and bless them out is sinful? Huh? How many of you know if you give them the salute, which I, I can't fathom, I, I say that, but I, at the same time, I can't fathom any believer doing that. Huh? How many, of you, how many of you know if you chase somebody down that does you wrong and you curse them out, how many of you know that's a sin? I mean, I know we're living in a day-to-day when preachers cuss from the pulpit and they say all kinds of different stupid stuff. But I'm going to tell you what. God tells us to watch our filthy conversation, be cleansed from it, and come out from among that. If we're living that, then we find ourselves walking in bondage. God wants us to confess our sins. He says if you're faithful and confessing your sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness john first john 1 9 how many of you are glad for that when, when i fail he's right there but how many of you know he doesn't want me to blow it off as though it's nothing When I fail, when I fall short, there's something deeper going on. i got to examine myself and say, God, help me to get to the root of why I failed. God, don't let me just blow off the surface of it. Don't let me just blow off the outward evidence of it. But God, let me get into the root. Let me see what's going on inside this man right here. Let me see what's happening so I can cleanse that, be delivered from that, and be set free from that. 
The church today, man, just, just walks around as though they want us to live with it. And you know why they want us to live with it? I don't want to get ahead of myself. It's because we don't believe in deliverance and the power of the Holy Spirit anymore. But yet 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man's in Christ, did you hear what it said? It didn't say if any man has Christ in them. It says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Creation. Not, not rearranged. Oh, I, I rearranged. I go to church now and I don't go to bars. I'm rearranged. I read the Bible, not pornography. I'm rearranged so I don't read no, romance novels, but I read Christian books. Oh, I'm sorry. Some of you might still read romance novels. Well, hopefully today you'll cast them in the fire and listen to them scream as they burn. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. We all know we're a work in progress, right? Anybody in here believe you've arrived and you don't need any more work? No, we sing that song, He's Still Working on Me to Make Me What I Ought to Be. Took him just a week, though, to make the moon and the stars. But I'll tell you what, it's taking him a whole lot longer to get my act together. Huh? Since I was 18 years old, and I'm only 29 now, but that's still a long time. <laughs> no, some 42, 43 years, God's been working on me. And I want to tell you what, sometimes I look and I say, God, I don't feel like I'm getting any closer to getting this thing taken care of. Sometimes I look at my life in the mirror and I feel like, man, you're a mess. Sometimes I'm... I, I'm, I'm dealing with so many things at one time. I allow it to stress me out. And I find myself going, God, what in the world? Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Help me. We, we like that. Christians are good at that. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And Jesus said, I've ha tried to help you. I've tried to help you. I'm helping you. I'm moving. I'm trying to help you. Stop moving without me. Stop walking without me. He, said, he didn't say walk on your own. He said walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you'll not obey the lust of the flesh. The problem is, man, we've been told we don't have to do that. I once was something, but now I am no longer. Did you hear me? I once was blind. But now I see. I once was deaf, but now I hear. I once was a whoremonger. I once was an idolater. I once was an adulterer. I once was a fornicator. I once was a drunkard. But now I've been washed. I've been justified. I've been sanctified. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And the power of God rules and reigns. I am no longer what I was. Moment by moment, day by day, I want to become more like Him. That's what Christianity has to preach. If you're still the same now as you were six months ago, much less if you're worse, somebody needs to spiritually slap you. Hello? But because we have coddled the church and we have not preached the divine blood of Jesus to let people know that there is victory over their sin, to let people know that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary so that not only have our past sins been forgiven, but our current sins can be forgiven and anything we do tomorrow can be forgiven and that his blood has not lost its power. His blood can set you free. The church is trying to convince people, though, that that's not necessarily important. Just love yourself where you are. I 
I don't want to love myself where I'm at if I'm an idolater. Do you? I want to throw myself at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, cleanse me. What has happened to church has taken the flame out of hell. Declaring that hell is just a state of mind. Or just a separation from God, which is true. But yet when Jesus describes hell in Mark 9, 44, he says, Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. It's not that we need to be hellfire and brimstone and beat people over the head and threaten them with hell. But yet we still need to let people know that there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a kingdom of God to walk in and there is a hell to shun. That one day you might find yourself in hell which is a life that has not been touched by God. The absence of Jesus will cause you to receive your declaration of eternity in hell. Jesus told the rich man Lazarus, the rich man in Lazarus, the rich man died. He had all the fine linens, he had all the wealth. Lazarus had nothing. Lazarus was sick, he was wretched, he was miserable. Dogs came and licked his sores. He was a he was a uh, a, a very downcast individual. But Lazarus died. He went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was buried in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And seeing Abram afar off, he asked, Could not Lazarus go get a drop of water and put it on my tongue? Just a drop. Now, I, I don't know. I think when I'm really thirsty, I like more than a drop. But you can see his desperation there, his agony. Man, just a drop. No, you can't do that. I want you to know today the church, in the church today, everybody goes to heaven. Did you hear me? Everybody goes to heaven. It doesn't make any difference how a person lives. After they've been dead a year, we say to them, happy heavenly birthday. People live vile lives. People are nasty spirited. People are mean spirited. People walk and live their life without Jesus. And ultimately, ultimately, you and I cannot say what they did in their last breath. But I tell you what, because I don't know what they did in their last breath, all I have to look at is their life. You say, and here's the church, here's the church. This is this, this is this perverted church. The church comes back and the church says, don't judge me. You can't judge me. People in the church don't want pastors to come to them and say, hey, hey, you're not doing right. Don't judge me. The Bible says not to judge. When you say that, though, you're showing your ignorance. Stop saying that. Because what he's talking about when he says not to judge, you can't judge somebody's eternity. I'm not the final say. God is. But he does tell us to look at the fruit that's being manifested. How am I going to know whether they're a wolf or a sheep by the fruit they bear? How am I going to know if they're one of Christ's disciples by the fruit they bear? And then if I look and see the fruit's not right, what am I supposed to do? Oh, bless your heart. It's okay. It's all right. That's, this is the church today. Oh, honey, it's all right. It's okay for you to act that way, walk that way, be that way, live that way, because I'm not going to judge you. And what you don't realize is, is what you're doing, what you're doing is you're licensing them to stay in the same nasty mess they're in. But that's not what the Word of God says. You see, the church doesn't believe the Word of God, though. The Word of God says when you see your brother in the air, when you see your brother in the fault, go to him. 
Speak to him about his heir. And if he listens, if you don't listen, what can you do? But if he listens, you've won your brother. He says, go and warn them of their wicked way. What are we doing when we let people go in the opposite way of the truth? What are we doing when we let Christians stay the same month after month, year after year? I'm going to tell you what. Some of you in this church have moved forward since I've been here in 12, 13 years. Some of you have been discipled. Some of you have really grown. Some of you have really matured. Others of you haven't. But you know what? I didn't let you sit there without warning. Hello? Hello? Some of you have grumbled, some of you have griped, some of you talk behind the scenes, which you always, you know, I've already told you, we find out about, we hear it. Whoever you talk to, they can't help but talk to, and they come back and they tell other people. And it travels back. And you grumble, you know what, I just wish that he would preach something else. We've heard that so many times. Why don't he move on to another subject? Ba, 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 ba. Well, I tell you why I don't move on. You want me to tell you why I don't move on? Because we're still sitting in the same place we were when I said it the first time. But I'm not going to let you sit there because you think maybe you've been around for a while, so that gives you some seniority or that gives you some right just to sit and do nothing. I'm telling you the truth. If you're sitting still, you're not growing. If you're sitting still, you're not maturing. If you're sitting still, you're a baby, you're an infant. You're whining and you're belly aching and you're crying and you're sitting around with your mouth yapping when what you need to do is fall at the feet of Jesus and let this word sanctify you. Come on. Sanctify us, oh God. You know, I accuse Christianity. You know what I accuse Christianity of today? Trying to help everybody to feel the chill bumps and to feel good about themselves no matter how they walk out of here. I'm going to tell you something. You may not like it. but you walk, You're going to walk out of here when somebody from this pulpit preaches. And you're going to know the truth and you're going to choose to go the opposite way. Do the opposite thing. Sit still. Stay where you're at. You're here today on Sunday morning, and I thank God for you. A lot of people are out of town today, but I thank God for you. You're here. You're here to listen to me do this. You're still here at 1221, still sitting, some of you. Something happens, you have to leave. We understand. Communion's at the back, outside the door. You can be served before you go home. But I'm thankful for you. But I'm just going to tell you right now. It takes more than this Sunday morning experience for you to mature and become what God wants you to become. And I don't care how much you did it before, it's what you're doing now. What am I doing now? Preachers today won't tell us the truth. They want to coddle us. The church wants a mother. The church wants the mother to pacify them. Bless your heart, honey. Bless your heart. I'm sorry, but that's not my role. My role is to say, bless you, honey, I love you, but get up off your seat and get busy. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. In Acts chapter 11, 26, or 16 through 26, he says, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these sayings, they became silent and they glorified God saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Woo! Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled Uh, as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to, to no one but the Jews only. But some of the men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go 
as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed with, for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for the whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They weren't called Christians because they were running around a part of the corner church. They weren't called Christians because they told everybody they were Christians. They were called Christians because those that were around them saw the mighty works of God's kingdom in their lives. They saw the miracles. They saw the word of God go out and people saved and healed and delivered. They saw blinded eyes open, deaf ears unstopped. They saw demons cast out. They saw cities turned upside down. That's why they were called Christians. Not because they were raised in church. Not because they went to church. Not because it was their heritage but because in Acts 5, 12, you see it. These Christians that we're talking about, they believed in signs and the wonders of God. And those signs and wonders followed them in a great way. The scripture says in Acts 5, 12, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. But today, though, today, though, what should we be like if the Spirit of Christ is in us? Hello? What should we be like in our everyday life if the Spirit of Christ is in us? Nobody's going to come in church here. Well, I have had people do this, but nobody's going to come in church here and be talking to somebody and be cussing at the same time. Nobody, nobody in here in their right mind is going to try to shout me down while I'm preaching. Because the other elders and those that are around you are going to come and they're going to cast whatever spirit it is on you all. Nobody's going to do that. But how many of you know Christians don't act that way anyway? Huh? What, what, what do, how do Christians act? How do Christians live? What do the Christians do? I'll tell you what they do because Jesus tells us what they're about. The scripture teaches us what it's about. The Christian teaches what our life should portray. The Bible teaches us what it says to us about how we are to live and what we are to be bearing in our lives. He says the fruit of the Spirit is jo love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Come on. That's what should be coming out of us. That's what people around us should be seeing. They shouldn't see us on Sunday morning praising God. And then on Monday badgering the living daylights out of them. Hello? Husbands and wives shouldn't be coming into church here on Sunday and, 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 and sitting there as though they have a love fest going on. And before they get home, some of the nastiest, vile stuff come flying out. Parents shouldn't be sitting in church. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm so happy my kids are up there. And then after they get out there, talking to their kids like they're a bunch of blooming idiots. Calling them stupid, morons, dumb, you're, you're never going to amount to anything. I don't know what's the matter with you. Why are you acting that way? You're just foolish. You say, I can't believe any parent would do that. Man, it's too bad we don't have video recordings. We shouldn't be in church on Sunday morning. Singing righteousness of God and the greatness of God and then sending our kids out into the world looking and acting like the world. 
Huh? It disturbs me. It disturbs me when parents post pictures of their kids getting ready to go to proms and homecomings and things of that nature. And man, listen, their dresses are embarrassing. All in the name of Jesus. You're feeding your kids to the wolves when you do that. Hello? Because parents are trying to be their best friends. Not their mom and dad's. I'm going to tell you what, I'm not my kid's best friend. I love them. I want them to talk to me. But man, I'm dad. And sometimes dad is going to tell you something you don't like. And when you tell me, but dad... All of our friends that are Christians at schools are, school are doing it. I tell you right to your face, I'm not their dad. Their parents can act foolish if they want to. For us, our house, we're going to try to do what God says. Having our kids know and understand what the fruit of the Spirit is and how it's portrayed in our lives. But man, that's not the end of it. Man, we are in a church world today that's preaching another gospel that they don't even believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Hello? Do you know that there's probably 75 to 80% of the church world that do not, does not believe and being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost today with the initial evidence I say initial because it's not the only one of speaking in other tongues hello they don't believe in the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge or the gift of faith or the gift of healing we blew those all out of the water a long time ago because we couldn't explain away why so many people were coming to church and not being healed. When we know the real reason why people are coming to church and they're not being healed, it's because we're living a mediocre, lukewarm life. Because God told me a long time ago, Jerry, stop asking me why. You know why. The reason I'm not doing the things that you want me to do and that, that, that I want to do is because you're not dead. Did you hear me? You haven't died to yourself. You're not going to live for yourself all week long and then come in and, and, and think that God's just going to flow through you like a river. You're not going to be hellacious all week long and think you're going to come in here and because you lift your hands up to a worship song and sing about something wonderful that all of a sudden the river's just going to flow through you because you're a child of the king. No, what he's going to get out of you first is when the river's flowing, he's going to get you on your face crying out to God, God, I repent. Kill me, God. Crucify me, God. Let me die to myself. Listen, church, if we would begin to fast and die to ourselves, the miraculous power of God would return to the church. We would see the gifts. Oh, it's getting late. And so I'm going to stop right here with this. As I've said this before, but yet I'm going to say it again because I believe it applies to us. I believe that we're trying to re remedy this. I'm thankful at least that I go somewhere where we're trying to remedy our error. I want you to know, the elders of this church, we are not sitting by justifying the fact that we have been lukewarm. Did you hear me? You, you didn't hear me. You said, are you mean to tell me you're confessing that we're lukewarm? That's what I just said. Does anybody in here feel that we're on fire hot? I, I mean, I don't even think the church in this day and hour, because we're not preaching the truth, because we're preaching another gospel. 
Paul also said to Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, he says this to the Galatians, I say it to you, who hath bewitched you? Who's cast a spell on you? Hey, listen, don't look at your neighbor. Look at yourself. Who's cast a spell on you? That you think somehow, some way, you start in the spirit. That you can somehow finish this race in the flesh. Leaders of Bethesda, I, I challenge you, examine yourself. Who, and answer the question, who hath bewitched you? into thinking that you can go any other way but by the Spirit. We have got so cozy with Christianity, religion, that we don't understand what kingdom life is really about. We have got so casual with Christian life that we cannot even recognize that we've gone astray. We have the word. Hello. Can anybody here tell me when you read the book of Acts and you look at us, can you say, whoo, there we are? Huh? I believe if Jesus and disciples came back to this earth and walked in the midst of the church, guys, you might as well sit down. I'm not ready yet. Because we got to get right first before we can take that. What, that's what Brad said. Isn't that what God's saying to you? You say, well, I've been a Christian for 25 years. Okay, well, today's your day to get right. Jesus and the disciples were walking right now in the midst of the church. Let's just forget about the rest of the church. If Jesus and the disciples would walk into Bethesda this morning. I believe Jesus would say, I have seen your patience. I have seen your labors. I have seen your serving. And I see how you have hated those that are liars. Those that say they are apostles and are not. But I have something against you. You left your first love. You walked away from our covenant. Listen, hear me. Don't get offended. Wipe off your feelings, please. But what the church has found itself doing, the church is whoring around with many lovers. The church prostituting itself with many gods, many idols, many vain things. And yet the Lord says, I'm here with you. Just return. Scripture says to Israel, you have played the harlot with many lovers. And they say to you, because you played the harlot with many lovers, because you went off and you left your husband and you played the harlot, that land's polluted and he can't have you, he won't have you anymore. But God says, but yet you've played the harlot with many lovers, but I say unto you, return unto me. Return to me says the Lord. That's what the Lord is saying here today. 
even though you have played around with many lovers, even though you have shared your affection with others, even though you have not been faithful and kept your covenant with me, I have kept mine with you, and I will draw you back if you will just humble yourself. Humble yourself. And call on my name. I may revisit the rest of this, but I tell you what, I am going to declare today I am going to declare today that Bethesda is leaving modern day Christianity. We will no longer affiliate ourselves with the false doctrine of Christianity. We will no longer associate ourselves with those who will not preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. We will no longer affiliate with a Another gospel Christianity that says, I can have my beliefs and you can have your beliefs. No, I tell you what we need to do. Let's sit down together and let's look at our beliefs and let's agree to come out of there with what does the book say. We live in a Christianity today that denies the power of God. He says, he says to them, they have, a, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Preachers in the pulpits are preaching today. They don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know why they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because their traditions that they've been raised in don't believe in it. And we walk around feeling bad because we want to be careful. We don't want to offend anybody with our believing in it. But if it was important in the scriptures for Jesus and his disciples, is it not important for us? Hello? Hello? You that are sitting here, you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason. There's got to be a reason why you're not coming after him. I'm going to tell you what. If I was sitting here today with the mess of this world's in today and everything that's going on and I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, if I couldn't go around during the day praying in the Spirit, if I couldn't go around during the day when I'm feeling lowly and downcast and I, don't go, I go around praying in the Spirit to build myself up in the most holy faith, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd be in that altar every single day, every single time. I'd be in my bedside. I'd be somewhere crying out, God, why am I not filled? Because what's created in this world of Christianity is we have a church on every corner with different beliefs. And we wonder why we're not having revival. We wonder why things aren't changing. We wonder why the world's rejecting us. Man, I'm just telling you right now, the world's not rejecting Jesus Christ. They're rejecting a lukewarm religious church. And I don't care who we sit down with. If we're wrong, we need to change at Bethesda. We want to do what the book says. I don't care what anybody else says. I want the book. But it's not God for there to be 175,000 denominations in different churches who are on the corner because they couldn't get along in the first place. If I preached this way in some of our churches in Elizabethtown, they would throw me out. Because I didn't make everybody leave with a warm fuzzy. I made the sinner uncomfortable. I made the churchgoer uncomfortable. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, the word of God made people feel convicted or feel 
in their terms would be, I, I, didn't, I don't believe we ought to have to walk around feeling condemned. Well, you know what? I'm not preaching this way this morning to condemn you. You don't have to be condemned. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, convict us because that's another fallacy that we have today. We're living in a church world that doesn't believe in conviction anymore. This is what we believe. Oh, just lift your hands up and repeat after me. Or we walk down the aisle and we shake the preacher's hand. Or we get baptized. None of that brings you into the kingdom. What brings you into the kingdom is the Holy Spirit overshadowing you, regenerating you, and you to put down your nets and start following Jesus. Huh? It ain't how much snot you sling. It's not how many tears you cry. It's not how much you laugh or giggle. It's not any of that stuff. It's not an emotion. It is just saying, you know what? Jesus has changed my life. Woo! I'm following Jesus. And how you know that you know that you know that there's been a transformation in your life is it's not just a blip on the screen. It becomes a lifestyle. And then when you fall short, you fall on your face and you say, woe is me, God. Cleanse me. And when we do that, he does. But our, our heart is to live every day free from sin and follow Christ. Stay with me today. Anybody in here want to have life and have it more abundant? Anybody in here want to bear fruit? Not just a little, but a lot. Abundant fruit. Anybody in here want to make sure you're attached to the vine and that the sap, the blood, the life of Jesus Christ is flowing through you? Anybody in here want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be led? Huh? Yes, Lord. You know, I want, to, I want to say this real quick. Jesus said, don't go anywhere. Tear and wait. Holy Spirit's going to come. I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to come. He's not going to be on you. He's going to be in you. What else is he going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin. He's going to. He's going to deal with unrighteousness. He's going to come along. He's going to testify of me. He's going to come to be the governor of the kingdom. Did you hear me? He is the spiritual government moving below the heaven and earth line. And He is flowing in us. He did not come in us to bring us into this inner sanctum where the Spirit of God has came and filled our spirit. You know, the Bible says the Spirit of man is the revelatory organ for man. The Holy Spirit comes and He, when He baptizes and fills, He comes into the spirit of man where now we have opportunity, not just naturally but spiritually, to have access to the Lord. Because the Bible said Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father not in here. But in the same place that the Father was when Jesus was here on the earth. In the kingdom of God, 
beyond this place where God has his throne, where the king of heaven dwells. And the reason why Jesus said, don't go nowhere, don't do anything until he comes, is so that you and I now weren't limited to seeing and hearing here that we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, could flow in and out, up and down, all over into the throne room of God where we could behold the Father and hear Him say, this is what I want you to do. Go do it. And so when we settle for the traditions of men, We are living under the old covenant. When we don't believe in allowing Holy Spirit to baptize us with fire and move us, as Renata said, beyond the outer court, which is just the flesh, into the holy place, which is the soulish realm, through the curtain, beyond the veil, into the holy of holies, where the presence and power of God is, we are just living under the old covenant. You and I, though, have greater opportunity than that, because we can go in and we can behold the Lord in the temple and there we can feast our eyes upon him and then just like they did we can move according to what we hear and see come on God's wanting to take us beyond where we're at but it's going to take us dying to ourselves it's going to take us surrendering to the Holy Spirit it's going to take us believing the whole Bible not parts of just the pieces that make us feel good it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause us to have to surrender. Where are you at today? What are you doing with this thing that we call the gospel of the kingdom of God? Are you believing another gospel? Are you caught up in another gospel that says God doesn't have to be first but a part? What kind of gospel are you believing today for yourself? Does your gospel, your life match up with what they preached in the New Testament? Does your life, does your sacrifice, does your servanthood measure to what you see out of the disciples' lives, those that have gave up everything? And he tells us that, doesn't he? Huh? He tells us that, doesn't he? He said, if you fight to save your life, you'll lose it. But he that will lose his life for my sake will find it. Come on, how many of you will lose your life? How many of you will lay it down? How many of you will give it up and say, I'm I'm, I'm rising up from here, living sacrifice. I'm going to live for the kingdom, not self. How many of you will step out from where you are at right now And you'll come forward. You'll raise up your hands to the Lord. You'll get your heart right. You will ask God to help you. You will ask God to change you. You will ask God to reveal himself to you. You will ask God to give you revelation. You will ask God, God, where am I? You know that he's talking to you. You will move right now. You will not wait. You will not tarry. You will not look around wondering when's everybody else going to go. God, I don't want to be the only one. You'll step out from where you're at. You'll come and you'll say, here I am, Lord. Change me. Here I am, God. Reveal yourself to me. God, I don't want to be out here on the outer. I don't want to be here just on the inner part. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Lift up your hands. Where you 
wanting the Lord to take you today. today. 